a hello uh, good afternoon to one and all welcome to today's webinar on migrating your microsoft applications to aws my name is giriraj daga i'm solutions architect with amazon web services in india i am joined today with one of our esteemed customers origo software technologies vivek sidagoda who is the cloud operation manager at origo he will uh, we will together share with uh, you how you can migrate your microsoft applications on aws before we get started a uh, quick uh, housekeeping uh, pointers this session is getting recorded uh, all the registrant participants will get the uh, link to the recording so in case you want to go back to something that you hear or share with others you will have the link uh, later in your email So let's get started. Uh, business is evolving at quite a rapid pace, and what we hear our customers tell us that uh, cost savings are definitely an important driver for them to look at cloud. Uh, but what discussions or journey start with cost savings? It's even beyond that. Uh, we are realizing that customer tell us that moving to cap from capex to opex models gives them the elasticity of the compute in the cloud. as well as uh, uh, they believe if the teams can apply their skills and applications on cloud they uh, anticipate a significant improvement in productivity of their workforce and while they are looking at uh, reducing their technical debt uh, by and improving their bottom line by moving to cloud they are also reimagining their businesses uh, using modern technology as part of a larger digital transformation projects and innovation and and uh, Uh, add more value to their end customers so while uh, we see a lot of reasons for enterprises and customers and partners of all sizes to move their workloads to cloud uh, it's now more of a question how they can do it quickly and it applies uh, same way for the microsoft windows workloads so in today's session uh, my goal is to cover some unique capabilities of aws and why you should Use AWS as a platform for running Microsoft applications. We'll uh, go through a sample reference architecture for my running Microsoft applications on AWS. We believe that could give you a starting point and help you to evolve from there based on your workloads. And we'll follow that up with some of the ways how you can optimize your workload uh, on cloud, uh, specifically the Microsoft Windows workload. Uh, how can you simplify deployment, migration, and monitoring of those applications on AWS? as i said uh, we'll also be joined by uh, one of the customers here oracle software technologies who have gone through this journey and who would like uh, vivek will share their learnings and their experience of migrating uh, all of the microsoft workloads on aws we'll wrap it up with some resources uh, and some takeaways and q and a based on how much time we have left so without further ado uh, let's get to the point why aws for microsoft application so aws has one of the largest uh, and most highly available infrastructure uh, to deploy applications on cloud we have 55 availability zones across 18 regions in the world we have points of presence across uh, 50 uh, across 26 countries in 59 cities all in all what that means is that if you're looking to expand your application and reach to customers across the globe uh, you have a partner where you can deploy your applications and reach uh, uh, scale uh, very quickly availability zone is a unique concept uh, like to just take few seconds and uh, go in a bit detail on what it is it's different it's collection of data centers uh, one or many that's put together called one availability zone every region of aws uh, for example you have regions in mumbai you us east one sydney all these regions the 18 regions across the world would have pleased have a minimum of two availability zones so one availability zone is a cluster of data centers one or many and then there is at least two availability zones that make up a region and these two availability zones are designed in a way to or all availability zones in a region are designed in a way that they uh, have single 
digit millisecond latency between them. And what that means is that you inherently, as a basic footprint of AWS cloud infrastructure, you get a highly available fault tolerant underlying platform. If you architect your applications well to distribute load across these availability zones within a single region, you make it more resilient and highly available. Each of these availability zones have a discrete separate power grid ISP provider. So you're uh, resilient against maybe a fire or flood uh, in one availability zone. If your applications are spread well across the availability zone, you can take the failure of one availability zone and your end user may not even notice that something went wrong in your underlying platform. To add to that, we have uh, the most experience of running Windows workloads on cloud. Uh, AWS was one of the first cloud providers to offer Windows Server back in 2008. Since the last 10 years, uh, customers uh, who started adopting Microsoft workloads for running business critical applications have scaled and grown on the AWS platform. We, the, the first Windows Server available back in 2008 were Windows Server 2003 versions, and we still support that on AWS. Uh, so you can get Windows Server 2003 AME and launch a Windows Server 2003 instance on AWS Cloud. This uh, scale and the growth of customers have led to uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of customers across many industries to uh, run their business critical applications on AWS. For example, Adobe, Autodesk, Capital One, General Electric, Hess, Kaplan, Pitney Bowes, Siemens, they all trust AWS to run their business critical Windows workloads such as Exchange, SharePoint, SQL Server, Active Directory, Dynamics, etc. So uh, you can find these case studies on our uh, public resources website. So that has constantly led to a lot of innovation and feedback from the customer to evolve the platform for running Windows workloads on AWS. While we're the global reach and the most experience, we also lead in the security and compliance certifications. All AWS services are GDPR ready, and they were ready much before the target date for that. What that means for the customers is that uh, the underlying platform compliance is available as a downloadable artifact right from their AWS console. So a customer today can go to their console, go to the AWS artifact service, download maybe a HIPAA compliance or uh, uh, SOC compliance reports and meet uh, part of their audit requirements. Uh, they still would have to uh, invest time and energy in and uh, auditing their applications workload running on AWS. But from the underlying infra perspective, that saves a lot of time and effort that the customer would be spending uh, on uh, overall uh, getting the compliance for their workload. And while this is happening, at the same time, this, the platform is quite, this, it's probably the broadest and the deepest platform we have, where there are many services uh, that uh, uh, provide an extended ecosystem for application developers and uh, infra uh, system managers. We have I think more than 125 plus services. Now, just last year, the total number of new features deployed were around 1,430. So this uh, innovation uh, uh, comes back to the customer. So what it means for the customer, for example, a DMS service, database migration service was launched uh, in March 2016. Since then, it has helped customers migrate uh, 85, over 85,000 databases uh, from on-premises or different sources to AWS. Um, you get a very highly performing infrastructure. You can achieve up to maybe 80,000 IOPS per instance uh, on the uh, platform. And while all this uh, uh, are considerable reasons why you should run uh, Microsoft applications on AWS, but at the same time, we continue to add value uh, by reducing, uh, we've done over 60, we've done 66 price reductions since 2006 to help in continually adding value uh, in migrating workloads to cloud. So now while we understand why you should, we can, why AWS is a, a partner of choice for you to run Microsoft workloads on cloud, uh, 
this discussion would not be complete without first talking about licensing. So what if, uh, what are your options uh, for running Windows workloads on AWS? Uh, one, you can buy the license included uh, Windows Server AMI from AWS. So you get pre-configured Windows, maybe with SQL Server if you like that. Um, as an AME, you can quickly launch those servers on uh, the environment. And let's say uh, you you use some of those workloads only for a certain time of the month, a few hours of the month, uh, a few hours of the week. As you pay for the compute cost per hour, the license cost is included in that per hour billing. So what it means is that there's no pre-commitment of how many Windows Server licenses you would need. You can you get the flexibility to start at your pace and scale at your pace. Uh, and by the license included model uh, uh, for, by the Windows Server licenses along with the EC2 servers when you launch them. AWS takes care of the license compliance, so that also reduces your uh, uh, effort and resources to be put on that. And it supports many of the current and the legacy versions. So you can launch a 2000 Windows Server 2008 or a SQL Server 2008 um, right up to uh, Windows Server 2016 and SQL Server 2016. So you, uh, and even SQL Server 2017. For that matter, um, so that helps you uh, to get started fast by going to use a Windows license included model from AWS. But uh, we completely understand that customers would have made some existing investment in uh, Microsoft licenses, and we encourage uh, our customers to completely uh, take advantage of that investment and bring them on AWS. So there are many different ways in which they can uh, bring their licenses on AWS and only pay for the lin compute price uh, equivalent of an Amazon Linux instance uh, because they're bringing their own Microsoft license on AWS. This way you can extend the life of your existing investment and uh, uh, still take advantage of the cloud infrastructure. And at the same time, you can probably create, uh, you can have best of both worlds where you bring uh, your existing licenses for most of the um, uh, predictable workloads. And then for the elastic workloads or for the new workloads, you can go for the license included model. So the options are available to you to mix and match to make sure whatever adds best value to your uh, workload and use case. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight is that there was a recent, and. Uh, a new feature launched a few uh, weeks back where, uh, or actually a few months back, sorry, uh, where you can control the number of vCPUs available on an EC2 instance at the time of launch. So what that means is if you uh, wanted to take an eight core machine, uh, maybe uh, with uh, 16 uh, GB RAM, and let's say your workload cared more about the 16 GB RAM than the eight cores. You could do with maybe a six core or a four core uh, for running your workload. Earlier, you did not have a choice because you had to go with the fixed size of instances. But now you can uh, select an eight core 16 GB RAM machine, but at the time of launch, you can say only enable four vCPUs. I don't need the other four. And then you have to only bring the license for the four core v vCPUs that you enable uh, on that instance. So that way, again, you get more options and flexibility to control your cost. Uh, while uh, taking advantage of the licenses that you already have. There's many different ways to optimize cost uh, and bring your own license or buy the license include model from AWS. Windows is a first class citizen on AWS and it has been uh, since a long time. Uh, as I mentioned, we were the first cloud provider uh, to launch Windows Server 2003 uh, on cloud. And since then, there have been many uh, improvements along the way just specific to windows workloads on aws i don't want to go through all of the line items here but a few key things i would like to highlight is dotnet core uh, 2.0 support was available uh, last year uh, and now i think now now we also support dotnet core 2.1 it was it became ga i think in may and by june we had it uh, available uh, and supported on our lambda services on code build so uh, doesn't matter where you are in the spectrum of the Windows workloads. If you're running some legacy workloads with Windows Server 2003, you can bring them on AWS, as well as if you're running some cutting edge uh, latest uh, .NET applications .NET, built on .NET Core or building uh, machine learning algorithms on Windows Deep Learning uh, AMI, you can, you can use both of them. You can be in anywhere in the spectrum and, and leverage the platform. It's uh, well supported on uh, AWS. And 
what that also uh, leads into is the the flexibility and the options that you have to run your workloads optimally on aws so while you can start your journey by taking your workload and deploying it uh, on uh, uh, ec2 virtual machine on aws uh, there is variety of options to select the right instance family and type uh, they are all designed for a specific uh, uh, purpose and goal in mind so by just selecting the right instance type can help you get the right performance and reduce your operation cost uh, for most windows workloads they require a balanced amount of cpu and memory uh, for those we recommend you can go with the general purpose compute instances there uh, uh the m5 series uh, is the latest in that uh, if you have a workload that require uh, that don't uh, require consistent performance all the time they may have like let's say it's a, it's an application where there's a lot of workload at the beginning of the day and the end of the day but in the, during the day or the later part of the day there's not much uh, uh, activity on the application there you can make it take advantage of a lower cost general purpose instance type called burstable with burstable performance called the t t series uh, just today we launched a new uh, instance type uh, uh, in that family t3 uh, so that again provides you uh, access to the latest uh, instance family uh, and and select the right instance for your workload uh, similarly in context of microsoft workloads i will emphasize the other key important thing will be typically these will be backed by sql server and sql server it will chew as much memory as you throw at it so there you can go with the memory optimized instances where you the number of cores are less because you're paying the sql server license by number of cores but really the performance is uh, uh, driven by most in most cases the available memory so there you can get more bang for the work by going to uh, by leveraging the memory optimized instances and there also be a variety of options from x1 x1e r5 r4 uh, and even uh, i3 is an interesting uh, option for uh, sql workload where it comes with an ephemeral storage so if you had uh, uh, let's say a legacy application that is very much reliant on a uh, temp db which by its nature is ephemeral it will uh, uh, once you restart uh, you start from scratch for those kind of workloads you can map your sql server temp db on the i3 local storage which is ephemeral once you restart it goes away but the uh, data file and the log files can be mapped to ebs volumes which are more durable so that way you can uh, get a uh, uh, better performance at lower cost uh, in many cases so it's something to consider so all in all that goes to say that the flexibility of the compute options available on the platform help you to not only just migrate your application but optimize them for uh, the expected performance and cost targets so now i like to go through some of the what i like to call the game changing features uh, on aws platform why uh, what are the differentiators that help you run microsoft applications uh, optimally on cloud and and the options flexibility there so the first thing I would like to talk about is the tenancy. Uh, while you can launch an EC2 instance on demand, and, and uh, uh, that's called a default tenancy on the platform, there are a couple of other options. Uh, one is the dedicated host. For some Microsoft uh, app, uh, products, you may need uh, visibility up to the uh, sockets, uh, and how many uh, you may need uh, control over how many vms are running on that physical server so tip that if if that is a requirement or a need you can go with dedicated host for example windows server uh, license if you want to bring over to uh, aws cloud that's what you would need to uh, use as an instance type because that requires visibility up to the socket for license compliance similarly there could be other workloads that uh, doesn't require the visibility up to the socket but the they need uh, to uh, ensure the customer only that particular customers vms are running on uh, the specific hardware uh, so they, for example the msd and license it's it's dedicated for that customer and so it can run on an infrastructure that's dedicated for the customer but they don't require probably the visibility to the uh, underlying socket so there you can make use of uh, option for dedicated instance where it will 
be a hardware dedicated for that AWS account, but uh, uh, no other customers instances would be running. It could be a mix of instance types running on that hardware. So uh, again, those two options along with the default tenancy gives you where I, the flexibility to select the right model for bringing your workload. VM import export is a utility that helps to migrate your VM from on premises. It, you can export that as an OVA, upload to S3, a storage service, and that makes it available as an AMI on AWS from where you can launch a new instance or uh, a EC2 instance on AWS. So it helps you to export your uh, 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 VM running from your environment onto AWS to help with the migration. Elastic volume is a uh, interesting feature of the elastic block storage service so elastic block storage service provides you block drives to be attached to your ec2 instances uh, let's say you want 20 gb or 100 gb disk to be attached to your ec2 instance you can attach that but what if your requirement and the uh, uh, business needs grows uh, let's say you need uh, another 100 gb to be attached a typical example will be exchange server where you migrate mailboxes you start small and then you grow pretty fast in that those cases elastic volumes allows you to not only just change the volume type from ssd to maybe provisioned iops ssd or, or they also allow you to at the same time to change the instance type you can go from 100 gb to maybe 200 gb or 500 gb and and um, uh, you don't have to shut down your vm for doing that so you just get the elasticity not only on the compute side but also on the block storage uh, side uh, while there are many workloads that would require full control of the SQL server running on any uh, VM, but there could be many places where you would want to reduce your management overhead of uh, database patching, updating the underlying OS, uh, maintaining the high availability, uh, snapshot, uh, all that maintenance work, which is not really adding uh, immediate business value. It's the underfinished heavy lifting that can be taken care by the managed database service RDS uh, for SQL Server, and it supports uh, ver uh, like the uh, uh, 2008, 2016, many different SQL Server versions. So you have a choice to still run the engine that is required for your application, but use a managed database service where the underlying uh, operating system, system patches are taken care by AWS and you your dba focuses on behalf of the db and the dba can focus more on the data application tuning and database schema um, amazon workspaces it's it's a it's a very interesting service i use it a lot it's like uh, uh, in few clicks the same way as i can get an ec2 server i can also get a client machine uh, a desktop on the cloud uh, in uh, few clicks on demand uh, in my past life, I have uh, worked as a .NET developer. I like to code in .NET once in a while, but in my current job, I don't get that. Uh, I don't have to. I don't work on coding for like 30 days of the month. So, but I, when I do, I like to work in Visual Studio IDE. Uh, so, what what I do is instead of paying, uh, getting a company license for Visual Studio, I even get that workspace on demand with Visual Studio installed, and I launch it uh, when I need it. So as a developer, I get an environment which is saved and uh, uh, available for me to access. Uh, and I only pay for pay per use for all the development tools installed on workspaces. There could be many other scenarios where you just use workspaces for that. Uh, so all in all, uh, you don't need to deploy an infrastructure to do for an infrastructure. You can use desktop OS on AWS by leveraging workspaces. Uh, System Manager is a hidden gem. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in the uh, later in the session. Uh, it's it allows you to access your instances uh, without actually uh, RDPing into it. So if you want to run a specific Windows command on a fleet of EC2 instances, Windows Server, you can send that command to System Manager, save it, and then uh, execute it on a set of Windows instances, and it can uh, uh, run the commands. Maybe you are capturing some logs or some data out of that. Uh, uh, executable it can be saved into s3 you can get notified through an sns topic and uh, uh, really improve your uh, uh, ability to administer and uh, manage your environment without uh, in a more cloud native way uh, aws config uh, the best way probably to uh, uh, understand the value of aws config is uh, thinking about how many times we have spent hours and 
uh, months over designing what's the right environment and uh, what's the right architecture for our application. But once it's deployed, are we confident that it's exactly what we uh, designed it for? Uh, most In most scenarios, not. There's always a configuration drift. Somebody may have added another ENI. Uh, they're launching maybe instance side that you did not uh, approve of earlier. So AWS Configs helps you to set business governance or uh, rules where uh, your environment, if they don't meet those uh, criteria, it can flag it as green and red and send an alert to uh, maybe an administrative email uh, and notify the managers, uh, management that there's something uh, that's, that was, it's in an unapproved, uh, something that's not approved is uh, certain environment and you can quickly catch that uh, in an automated way and then take corrective actions on top of that. Uh, Similarly, we see some of the common workloads like Active Directory. Uh, most Microsoft workloads may need that, and you may want to, uh, you can, while you can uh, create a DC uh, role uh, on an EC2 instance and run ADDS tools, ADDS service on EC2, but at the same time, you have an option of using a managed Active Directory where uh, the underlying uh, uh, OS patching or maintaining the DC uh, in a highly available mode is taken care by AWS. And these are act, real active directory bits running uh, in the Microsoft Active Directory Managed Service. So you can still do domain join. You can still bring uh, use your uh, GPO policies. You can bring them over. You can create or use. You still have the control to do uh, what you need to do. But at the same time, the underlying Active Directory uh, from, is managed. So uh, uh, definitely encourage you to explore that service. There's a server migration service. If for, it helps to do live migration at scale. If you have a vCenter managed application environment, uh, you can create a connector which will uh, create snapshots of live running environment, save them as a MI in your AWS in console from where you can launch an EC2 instance. And this can be done at scale uh, in a fully automated way. So there are many more such services and features on the AWS platform, but due to the constraints of time, I'll just stop here and uh, but take a moment to just reflect back on uh, some of the powerful features that enable you to run Microsoft Windows workload uh, more optimally, more reliably on, on AWS. And this has resulted in many customers uh, leveraging the platform uh, for running the business critical application. For example, InfoR, they talked at, uh, spoke at the in reInvent last year. They've run thousands of SQL Server databases. Uh, yeah, you heard it right. It's thousands of SQL Server databases on AWS, and they believe uh, they claim that they it saves them 75% of their monthly backup cost. Has uh, another example where they have gone uh, run their exchange, uh, many uh, critical business workloads on AWS, and and uh, 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 reached high availability. Uh, Edwards. Uh, they, they run uh, their mission critical business workloads on AWS and they've gone through a long journey of migrating uh, applications out of their data centers into AWS. Uh, you'll see a main common pattern that while customers are moving into AWS, their Windows workloads, uh, some of the common themes is like it helps them save cost, uh, improves their availability, uh, make them secure, and also uh, improves their performance. So that's, uh, and you can find many more case studies on our uh, online uh, public resources. So that leads to where, so where do you start? Now we know it's a good platform to run your Microsoft Windows applications. How do you, how, where will you get started? So to get started, one thing I want to say is all your experience and uh, uh, skills developed on running Windows applications uh, so far on premises or other platforms, they easily, they pretty much translate to uh, AWS. So the, you, it is still, you have a server, you have full control on that server, you can bring the license as you see fit, and you can use the same tools that you've been using. For example, if you're using PowerShell to administer your environment, you can easily use PowerShell, continue to use PowerShell to administer your environment on AWS. So this is what I believe could be a sample reference architecture for running Microsoft, uh, maybe three tier application. Uh, you see on the left side, there's a public subnet. Uh, treat that as your DMZ that's accessible to internet. And then there are private subnets which are not directly accessible from internet. So when a user request comes through, uh, they will go to the internet gateway, hit maybe a software defined load balancer called Elastic Load Balancer. It supports layer four, layer seven, um, TCP IP, UDP, 
So it can help distribute load across a set of uh, EC2 instances, uh, which are placed in separate availability zones. So here you see the blue arrow points to the top and bottom. So the users can access the ELB, which is in the public subnet, but that distribute load to instances in private subnet, uh, improving your security posture where your web servers even don't have to be exposed uh, to the public uh, subnet. And it's a good point to call out here is if you architect this way, the top side is one availability zone. Let's call it uh, availability zone one. The bottom is availability zone two. Uh, if you recollect, I mentioned each region will have a minimum of two availability zones. And uh, now uh, let's say uh, if a fire or a flood happens in one of the availability zones, it's completely down. If you architect it this way, your application will continue to function by uh, transferring the load from load balancer to the web instance without really uh, letting the end user uh, uh, have any awareness of the impact on the underlying infrastructure. Uh, and the auto scaling group there, if, if your web servers are wrapped up around an auto scaling group, that can uh, you can set a min max instance size on the auto scaling group and based on uh, maybe some parameters, more requests coming in or network packets in and out, it can automatically scale out more servers and add it to your uh, load balancer, attach them to the load balancer, or it, at the same time when the thresholds change or the need change, it can, it can set scale in policy where it will scale back into a smaller number. We can take advantage of the elasticity of cloud by taking advantage of ELB and auto scaling group for your uh, stateless components. Uh, you see a gray uh, bar around the SQL server uh, that shows that you can deploy, uh, you can leverage the Microsoft technology of always on availability group for running uh, highly available databases uh, and data allows you synchronous, asynchronous commit options. Uh, the same can be, uh, you can use always on availability group across availability zones. That's a message or that's a uh, takeaway I would like you to call uh, uh, out. Uh, it, and um, please take note uh, that availability zones in a way are spread uh, maybe a uh, few uh, tens of miles apart. So even at that distance, each the availability zones are connected on an uh, by dark fiber to provide a single digit millisecond latency. That enables us to do an always on availability group configuration across two availability zone, which have a separate power supply, separate ISP provider, uh, more fault tolerant and resilient design for running your Microsoft workloads on AWS. You can use Active Directory on EC2 or use the AWS directory service, the managed Active Directory that we talked about uh, uh, a few seconds ago. Uh, to domain join to implement your gpo and this could be your reference architecture and this directory service itself is spread across uh, the availability zone and for any kind of uh, maybe backup of your workloads if you want to store that onto s3 you don't have to go out through the internet you can tunnel it through a vpc endpoint a construct or a feature in aws where uh, it will go through the private backbone and not go out to the internet uh, to the blobs uh, or the object storage service to connect back to your on-premises environment, you can use a VPN or direct connect. VPN is just IPsec VPN tunnel to your corporate office or a physical lease line uh, like AWS direct connect into your uh, into your corporate data center to create hybrid environments and interact with your workloads uh, on running on AWS as well as corporate office. So if you have intranet applications that don't need internet access, you can come through your direct connect or VPN connectivity to your AWS environment, set up an internal load balancer, which distributes load uh, across to the web servers and same way, uh, 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 make it available for your end users. One of the other common patterns we see is that uh, many of the Microsoft components of technology are common or shared across environments or, or workloads. For example, Active Directory, maybe there's a master database, uh, you can put SCPM, uh, you can put that onto a shared services VPC, and uh, then you can peer your other workloads and other uh, uh, VPCs to take advantage of that uh, shared services. Uh, VPC is a, a, a common place to host your common Microsoft components. If you need to create a transit, global transit network, you can uh, use transit VPC architecture pattern to create a hub and spoke model and go, uh, or sorry, go, create a transit uh, network and go from the transit VPC, uh, let's say a workload in A needs to talk to workload in the VPC B, 
you can go to the transit vpc or if you want to make sure all your workloads go through transit vpc maybe firewall installed in a transit vpc and then connect back to the corporate data center through one vpc you could also use this pattern for that so what we typically see is that order of migration is important when you're migrating microsoft uh, workload you typically start with active directory uh, and then go on to maybe uh, uh, figure out exactly how you want to extend your domain or create new uh, forest and, and establish trust or bring your existing group policies uh, on the environment there are many options uh, for you to run ad aware workloads on aws one is you can continue to use your on premises active directory and run your application on aws you'll have to be aware of the latency between the environment but you still can do it second option is you can run a uh, domain controller on an ec2 server uh, on aws as your uh, active directory and then and, and uh, 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 enable your micro cloud ad aware uh, workloads or third option is you can use a managed Active Directory so that the undifferentiated heavy lifting is taken care of by AWS and you still take, uh, uh, you can still enable the AD aware workload on AWS. Uh, you can extend an existing domain, like here in this case, Amazon.com from on corporate network to AWS. Uh, you just have to be uh, aware of the site link cost. Uh, the lowest one uh, takes uh, uh, is used for authentication. So this way you can ensure that if you manage your uh, site link cost well, uh, user authentication will happen to the closest domain controller and, and uh, uh, not introduce additional latency. I still make it fault tolerant if the closest, latent, closest link does not work, it can fall back to the uh, higher cost link. You can create federated trust. You can create ADFS or Okta or some of the third party tools like Ping Identity and deploy it on your AWS environment. Uh, you can have a resource directory uh, on uh, AWS or a user directory, and then federate uh, use federated trust to connect to your domain on premises. You can have completely isolated domains uh, where you can establish, and this I see is more common, where you can create a one-way trust between your uh, resources hosted on AWS and Active Directory on uh, uh, your on-premises environment, where you trust the users on on-premises directory to have access to resources uh, on AWS. Well, do, well, it's not true vice versa. So either you don't trust the users created in on-premises, uh, sorry, users created in uh, AWS Active Directory or domain controller to have access to on-premises servers. And it's a good place to start a discussion with your security and networking team to have completely isolated domains and use one-way trust to uh, enable uh, uh, integration between your on-premises and AWS. You can continue to use uh, Microsoft Active Directory as your primary directory where you have all users uh, and resources. This is typically common with customers going all in on AWS. Um, while at the same time, uh, you can federate your and continue to use SaaS applications like Office 365 or Azure Active Directory to uh, integrate with that. And uh, the flexibility uh, is available with the customer. If they don't want to use this as a primary directory, maybe they want to continue to use an on-premises uh, directory as the primary directory. You can still use that and use managed uh, active directory as only a resource directory and then federate users uh, from on-premises uh, to your uh, SaaS application. So uh, uh, there's also a typical challenge of uh, not maintaining too many identities. In AWS, uh, the permissions are more controlled through IAM roles and policies. Uh, you can uh, have best of the both worlds by mapping your, uh, managing your identities in Active Directory, but mapping them to IAM group permissions so that uh, you can create maybe, let's say, a backup administrator AD group that has only access to an EC2 server in S3 and does not have access to DynamoDB. Uh, so that will require you to maintain, uh, just map your Active Directory groups to IAM group, which has uh, uh, controlled permissions to the resources you would like to map to. So you, you can use for identity federation to uh, maintain only single source of truth uh, for your uh, identities. Uh, after Active Directory, so we realize there are many options where you can run Active Directory uh, on AWS. Typically after that will come SQL Server. Uh, you can use the managed Active, uh, Managed database service RDS for SQL Server, or uh, you can run SQL Server in EC2 for full control. I'd always recommend to start with RDS because it gives you a highly available design right out of the gate. You can create multi AZ SQL Server with synchronous commit, or you can set up 
always on availability group uh, within a region uh, uh, with synchronous commit across two availability zones. At the same time, for a really uh, highly uh, extended architecture, if you want to maintain a copy of your database in another region, let's say you're in Mumbai, you want to maintain another region in Singapore, you can do uh, continue to use always on availability group. But just that the second region, we recommend that to be an asynchronous uh, uh, replication, asynchronous commit because you would not want to uh, degrade your application performance to wait for the commit on the uh, region which might be uh, thousands of miles away. Uh, there's also uh, the while the always on availability group helps you to replicate your database, but sometimes you want to replicate the entire instance, for example, with SQL Server jobs, agents running on it. Uh, for that, you can use the Microsoft uh, Windows Failover cluster instance, and uh, uh, there you can take advantage of the, some of the third party services we have called SIOS Data Keeper Cluster Edition, which helps you to replicate the instance, the complete instance, uh, 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 and maintain another copy. Uh, for high availability. Uh, there are many ways in which you can migrate data uh, to the SQL Server on AWS. You can use database migration service where you start uh, an instance uh, on AWS, you set the source to your uh, on-premises uh, SQL Server maybe, and then target as uh, either SQL Server on EC2 or RDS on AWS. It uh, you can select the table schema you want to be replicated, and it will replicate your entire database onto AWS, and it keeps it replicated. You can do some validation at the point that you are ready. You see that yeah, all the data objects and everything has been validated. Technical validation is complete. At that point, you can decide to switch your application users from uh, on-premises to the AWS RDS instances. So this is what your final uh, sample architecture uh, on AWS would look like. Uh, with all the extended ecosystem, we don't have time to go over all of that, uh, but I would encourage you to explore some of these extended ecosystem uh, to optimize your workload uh, on AWS uh, after you migrate. Uh, before I go further, I'd request uh, uh, Vivek uh, to uh, share their journey uh, of how Origo uh, to migrated their Windows workload on AWS. So over to you, Vivek. Good afternoon, guys. I'm Vivek. I manage cloud operations at Oracle globally. Uh, the reason I'm speaking today as part of migrating Microsoft applications to AWS is uh, to give you guys an understanding uh, about our company size so that you will be able to compare it with your company size, the nature of business and the tools and technologies which you're using, uh, which will give you a better understanding to migrate uh, your applications to AWS. Uh, I will give you an overview of our company before we start. We are a privately held US corporation. Our HQ is in Austin, Texas. We have only owned subsidiaries in Canada and India. We have 15 years of building and delivering enterprise software solutions to transportation agencies across North America uh, with over 5,000 person years of experience. Uh, we are currently uh, the leading uh, cloud-based capital program and project portfolio management software uh, provider uh, in the world. And uh, we have private and public organizations using Masterworks to plan and deliver over $250 billion worth of capital programs. This includes roads, bridges, pipelines, water utilities, oil and gas refineries, ports, campuses, and buildings. Uh, so the focus is uh, currently on USA and Canada, uh, mainly North America, and all the Software uh, is our intellectual property. We have built it from scratch. There is no stitchware involved. We are also SSAE 16 Type 2 certified, SOC 2 certified. We are part of uh, Red Ring Global and Red Winner. We have received Microsoft Innovation Award in 2010. We are a Microsoft Managed Partner. We are Microsoft Gold Partner. And we are also AWS Advanced Technology Partner. These are some of our customers. Uh, you can see there are State Department of Transportation. Uh, you can see Ministry of uh, Ontario Transportation, uh, which is in Canada. 
and we also have DART UDOT, which is Utah Department of Transportation, and there are some cities and counties like Lincoln, Fargo, Pinellas County, Tampa Bay Water. All of these customers are using Masterworks to deliver capital and project management portfolio. So this is our platform. So Masterworks is not just a product. Uh, it, it is a platform on which we have built all these uh, products. So you can see project management, document control, civil rights, federal aid reimbursements, claims management. All of these modules are part of Masterworks software suite. Uh, once a customer decides to use Masterworks, they will choose which of the modules they want to use and they will uh, get those modules which they can use in SaaS mode. So the reason we migrated to AWS is we had different hosting providers in US and Canada. Uh, we were on some legacy uh, cloud service providers uh, who were closing business and uh, this was a cause of worry too. And we had different cloud service providers in US and Canada. Uh, so this was a challenge with standardization. Uh, we were not able to implement same standards across US and Canada. So we were uh, looking for a cloud service provider which uh, as presence in both US and Canada. When we started uh, this migration uh, idea, I mean, when we started thinking about migration, we didn't have uh, the AWS data center in Canada and they uh, were still working on it. And when we got the AWS data center in Canada, we started working on it, uh, the migration. Uh, and they also uh, were getting our feedback on the urgency of the requirement for a data center in Canada. I don't know how much uh, uh, it played its role. Uh, but we got it within like two or three months after we started talking about a data center in Canada, AWS data center in Canada. So uh, now if you look at cloud service providers availability, there are not too many uh, uh, cloud service providers available in Canada. There are only a handful. And if you have to choose uh, the best, uh, you have to do a detailed evaluation. We did the same. Uh, we did a detailed evaluation between AWS and some other cloud service providers, which are market leaders. And then we decided AWS would be good for our use case. And we decided uh, to migrate to AWS. Uh, one of the reasons uh, which we considered while migration was high availability, uh, we are using North Virginia region in USA, which has uh, now like five to six availability zones there. It helps us distribute the load, uh, auto scale, use elastic load balancer, uh, and maintain availability uh, to provide the SLA we have promised to our customer. So we selected AWS uh, for these reasons, right? Uh, for example, compliance certification says, uh, very important as most of our customers are public sector companies, public sector organizations. So AWS has something called uh, Artifacts Console where we can uh, download the SOC2 reports or NST reports or FedRAMP reports. So these reports serve as uh, templates for us and most of the times the question will be about the infrastructure service provider and the infrastructure security. So we can make use of this readily available documents which will uh, you know, uh, help us complete 50% of the work when we are going through security audits with our customers. Uh, AWS has a very good understanding of Microsoft uh, applications, Active Directory and SQL. Uh, so we started using the managed Active Directory. We are using uh, on-premises Active Directory with on AWS EC2 instances now. There have been a lot of changes with the managed Active Directory. Now uh, we're looking forward to use it. Uh, for SQL, we are making use of uh, SQL Server I availability group. This is again on EC2 instances with a file server witness server. Uh, we are also using RDS in our uh, dev instances. Once our application is certified uh, on RDS, we are planning to migrate from the EC2 based Microsoft SQL Server to RDS. Again, uh, as I mentioned, the availability zones are more uh, so we can maintain snapshots we are doing it we are taking daily ami backups and we are taking ebs snapshots as well so in case of a disaster it is easier for us to meet our rpo and rto timelines so we can just take an existing ami launch new machine within a couple of minutes so this is very helpful for us so we don't have to uh, uh, 
go through a scenario where the application is down for a long time, uh, which will affect our SLAs. So what we have done so far, uh, we have migrated 100 plus applications across multiple environments. Uh, so these are .NET based applications. We make use of IIS as web server. Uh, there is a Microsoft SQL Server Enterprise backend, uh, which is on Windows uh, Server 2012 R2. Uh, we have 15 terabyte of build data. So these are web applications. So every web application is isolated. Uh, no two customer applications are uh, together. Uh, so we also make use of SSRS, SQL Server reporting services for our report requirements. So this is again integrated with uh, .NET. We completed migration within uh, four months. We started sometime uh, in August 2017 and we were uh, done by January. We have done a TCO analysis and compared to the cloud services providers we had earlier, we have uh, seen a 75% reduction in TCO. One of the good things uh, about AWS is we, are, we were able to increase the uh, size of the EBS volumes uh, on the fly. Uh, the performance is definitely better. We have done a comparison. Uh, for example, if you take a four core CPU, 32 gig RAM, machine on AWS and compare it with uh, another cloud service provider, uh, the AWS seem to perform better. So we have the numbers and we have uh, done uh, this detailed analysis. Uh, that's astonishing. Maybe uh, it is due to the millisecond latency, which uh, Giri was explaining earlier uh, in this webinar. So that AWS definitely gives a better performance compared to other cloud service provider, at least for our applications. Um, so we are hosting 200 plus applications on AWS now uh, from dev to production, including QA, UAT, pre-prod, disaster recovery environments. We have 45 uh, plus terabyte data on EBS and over 18 terabytes data on S3 now. So how we did it, we uh, created the team and we did a detailed evaluation. We, were, uh, we wanted to be very sure before we migrate to AWS and we uh, completed detailed proof of concepts. Uh, we started with uh, precision. So we established a master account and then we created multiple accounts for dev, environment, lab, production, and non-production. And then we linked all of it to the master account. Uh, this gives us better control. For example, if you don't want business support to be enabled for dev account, so you don't have to. So you can just enable it for a production and non-production account wherever UAT instances, user-facing instances are hosted. Uh, so it it lets you optimize your costs well. And we decommissioned our existing data centers after we migrated to AWS. And uh, we are continuing to evaluate uh, more and more platform services now. Uh, we are making use of Amazon Workspaces. We are using AWS Code Deploy with our DevOps. Uh, in, DevOps service, and we are making use of RDS. We also make use of Amazon Kinesis to stream data. We are using a combination of CloudWatch, CloudTrail, and Amazon Kinesis uh, for our security requirements. We are making use of a managed security service provider called SecureWorks, uh, which is a Dell subsidiary. So it gets uh, the feed from CloudTrail, CloudWatch, uh, and Kinesis, and uh, reports incidents uh, you know, within no time. So which gives us a better control over security of our infrastructure also. So some of the good learnings uh, which uh, we have got from this AWS migration, which will be useful for you guys also. Uh, so we started with security first. We are making use of Elastic Load Balancer as an additional layer on top of the EC2 instances where we are hosting our uh, .NET web application. Uh, so no, tri no traffic directly hits the web server also it uh, it's the elb and it gets terminated there only valid requests get through the ec2 instance so the platform is highly available uh, we have not experienced any downtime related to infrastructure since we migrated to aws and yeah it gives better performance on the same size server compared to other cloud service providers and one very good learning uh, we got from this migration was we had a scenario where we had 240,000 files greater than one terabyte size and we had to migrate it from a different cloud service provider to AWS. So this was uh, very tricky 
uh, the copy was getting terminated because of the file size and then we made use of AWS CLI. Uh, so you just have to install the AWS CLI tool uh, for Windows and then make use of PowerShell and you, there is a command called sync command AWS S3 sync command. If you use it, uh, it uploads all the files uh, to S3 bucket from where you can download all the files to ec2 instance the advantage with this is if the copy gets abruptly terminated when you run the sync command again it will copy only the files which are not copied again this will save you a lot of time and you don't have to worry about the downtime and we were able to just uh, you know uh, have a downtime of less than 10 minutes uh, when we migrated this big customer from another cloud service provider to aws so uh, with the same customer we recently had an issue this will be uh, useful for all you windows folks out there so when you attach an ebs volume ensure that uh, you select gpt as the partition type for your data drives if you select mbr which is the default setting so you will not be able to increase the size to more than two terabytes uh, this is something which will be helpful uh, because uh, the command commands to convert mbr to gpt won't work with uh, aws ebs volumes because windows operating system considers the ebs volumes as uh, something externally attached so uh, as it is considered as something externally attached you won't be able to execute commands like uh, disk part uh, and convert MBR to GPT. So and so be careful select GPT for all the data drives and the EBS volumes can be configured flexibly. Uh, uh, we can change from a general purpose SSD to provision IOPS SSD and we can increase the size of the EBS volume without any downtime. Uh, for example, if you have a 500 gig drive and uh, you're, you've already at 499 gig and you can uh, during business hours and you cannot afford downtime. So you can just go to the ABS volumes, modify volumes, uh, increase the size to 750 gig or a terabyte, and just go to disk management in Windows and uh, just uh, allocate that additional size which you just attached in EBS. So we are using managed services wherever it is possible. Uh, we are also making use of reserved instances. Uh, we are using no upfront one year convertible reserved instances now which gives us flexibility to change instance types if required so uh, just last week we changed from r4x large sql server enterprise to r42x large sql server enterprise so uh, if you are not sure about what uh, the infrastructure or the, what the compute and memory requirements is start with no upfront convertible uh, instances so what we are planning to next on uh, AWS, we are planning to increase automation. Uh, we will optimize DevOps by making use of code, commit code, pipeline and code deploy services, more and more platform services on AWS. We are also working on uh, integrating Alexa uh, with Origo Masterworks. Uh, that's all I had. Thank you, folks. Hey, uh, thanks, Vivek. Uh, hope you found the journey of Origo in migrating Microsoft workloads to AWS helpful. What I wanted to wrap up this session by saying, while we focused on uh, why AWS is a great platform for deploying Microsoft applications, the benefits, uh, the patterns in which you can do Active Directory uh, and SQL Server on AWS, uh, there's also a, a lot of other uh, reasons on how you can simplify management by using system manager. You can do infrastructure as a code by actually creating, uh, you're translating your infrastructure, your servers, load balancers, the database, the EBS volume, the security groups, everything associated with your infrastructure as a code file and save it and then deploy another region or another uh, environment based on that template. So you can really get to infrastructure as a code and automate your uh, environment. And there's also a lot of support for .NET developers. I saw many questions out there on .NET. Maybe we'll try to cover in another session uh, where uh, you, if you're using Visual Studio, you're using there's a command led for AWS PowerShells. Uh, so whatever the you you can completely deploy an application uh, on Windows containers uh, on using Elastic Container Service. You can deploy into AWS Lambda for your .NET Core 2.1 app. You can build it on code build. You can use X-Ray as a mechanism for more microservices debugging and uh, uh, logging. 
uh, we didn't cover CloudWatch and CloudLog. So this is a very extended platform with a lot of services. Uh, I'd encourage you to look at some of the resources that are highlighted on this deck right now uh, to explore further. And please do drop in with your questions and we'll try to answer as many as we can. Uh, thanks for joining uh, this session. And then, yeah, there'll be a survey as you uh, finish this uh, webinar. We request you to please share your feedback that will help us to plan and improve upon uh, for the next webinars. I uh, really appreciate everybody taking time to hear about uh, running Microsoft applications or Microsoft applications on AWS. Thank you and uh, wish you all the best.